Welcome to the Group Dentistry Now Show, the voice of the DSO industry. Kim Larson and Bill Newman talk to industry leaders about their challenges, successes, and the future of group dentistry. Visit groupdentistrynow.com for more DSO analysis, news, and events. Looking for a job or have a job to fill? Visit joindso.com. We hope you enjoy today's show. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Group Dentistry Now show. I'm Bill Newman, and as always, we appreciate everybody listening in today. Uh, you know, we, we we're, I think we're up to about 120 plus podcasts, and uh, always have great guests. Always learn a lot. So, um, but the reason I bring that up is I don't think we've ever had anyone on our podcast from outside of North America. So it's mostly U.S. DSOs. Uh, we have had a couple Canadian uh, DSOs and, and, and representatives from, from DSOs on, but I don't think we've actually had anybody um, from, from the U.K. on for sure. And so it's kind of an interesting story. So I, I, I do want to, first off, uh, Dr. Dev Patel, uh, the CEO and founder of uh, Dental Beauty Partners is with us. So Dev, um, thanks for being here today. No, thanks for having me, Bill. Hi, Bill. Uh, kind of wanted to set the stage for this and how we De Dev um, agreed to be on the podcast. So uh, Chicago midwinter meeting and uh, Iva Clark Vivident happened to have a really great 100th birthday party celebration. And right before that celebration in Chicago, they did a DSO panel discussion and, and Dev happened to be sitting next to me on the panel and we had a couple folks, we had somebody from Aspen and we had somebody from Heartland. So um, when Dev and I were, were talking and he shared some great information, although it was only a 30 minute panel discussion. So there wasn't a lot of time to share, uh, but he shared some, some great info. And I said, hey, we'd love to have you on the podcast. And I mean, within a week, he's on the podcast. So I appreciate you turning this around so quickly. No, it's, uh, it's how I think works in my life, Bill. <laughs> That's good. Good. I'm glad. Yeah, we don't we don't we didn't want to delay anything. So if you wouldn't mind, could you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, so I'm a dentist by uh, profession. I graduated from the University of Manchester in 2012. Um, bit of an entrepreneur, had three companies in the last 10 years since I graduated, um, two of which or well, well, all three of which I've exited uh, at least once now. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very passionate dentist about trying to improve the quality of, of care for patients in the UK. Um, a lot of the historical care has always been about, you know, quick in and out national health service, government-based dentistry. And I'm trying to really raise the bar to offer them best in class out-of-pocket service that could really change the patient experience and, and their outcomes. Um, but yeah, I can go on for years talking about myself if I want to. So I'll, I'll stop there for now and talk more later on in the podcast. But I, be, before we move on to, to some other things, so you, you mentioned you you started uh, three companies, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah. Can you, would you mind talking a little bit about those organizations? Sure. So um, first one was uh, two years after I graduated called Dental Circle. Um, Dental Circle essentially is an online networking platform, a bit like Facebook and LinkedIn mashed together. Um, so we wanted to create a closed professional network where you could communicate between peers, share cases, before after photographs, have a portfolio of your work, um, your clinical history of what courses you've been on to, go on to new courses that we run, um, conferences, events, and also recruitment, all on one platform. Um, so we built this uh, literally on a whim uh, after I graduated and it became the biggest platform in the UK within two years. And we have half the UK network, half the UK dentists in the network now. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's quite a large platform. That's great. Yeah, that, that, that's exciting. We um, we built something similar for the um, dental industry uh, called Dental Sales Pro uh, back in 2008 and same same concept and uh, ended up selling that to a medical publisher. So uh, kind of thinking along the same lines uh, in the dental industry, just different audiences. Yes, exactly. Um, second company was called Brushlink, um, which is still in the US uh, from what I understand. I created a small device you can put onto a toothbrush, any toothbrush, which is the most important thing because the ones from Philips and Oral-B, as you know, are very expensive and they only tailor, they can only do very minimal accuracy in terms of the data um, for how well you brush. So we can put the device onto any toothbrush, manual or electric, 
and essentially it links to an app. And as you brush your teeth in real time, you can see what you're brushing on the app. Um, and actually it can change the color from blue to white as you're brushing it off your teeth, the plaque. Um, so it gives you accurate data on how well you brushed and that will give you clinical outcomes to improve your oral health. Um, and then we link that up with some of the insurance companies and DSOs in the US, which is now, from my understanding, still um, out there and, and launched. And we integrated it with Dentrix and a few other softwares. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's one of those um, products that I thought I had a great passion for because in the UK and globally, there's still a lot of work being done to fix teeth rather than just solve in the beginning just by brushing better. And if you brush better and you remove all the plaque and chew off your teeth, that actually you can solve a lot of issues before you even have to have them in the first place. Um, which is quite counterproductive when you have a DSO because you're trying to cut your, cut your patient base off or afterwards, right? Um, but yeah, so it was one of the things I wanted to really launch. And obviously the US market being very bullish on IoT and technology and and, and employee healthcare uh, was the right market to launch it in. Um, so, you know, we worked with companies like DentiQuest, Cigna, um, UHC and a few others. And yeah, it seems to be going well, but we got acquired in 2020 um, and I'm no longer part of that company anymore, so moved on. There you go. The third company is my DSO. So, yeah, once again, try to be something different in terms of the typical UK corporate model, which has always been about buy a business, own the whole thing 100%, and then get an investment on and keep growing so, it. So this is Dental Beauty Partners? Yeah. Okay, well, yeah. I'll pause there because I think we wanted to set the stage uh, a little sure. bit. So, again, we you're in the UK, Market's a little bit different than it is in the U.S., so maybe give us a little bit of an overview of kind of what's going on in the U.K. Um, you know, wh what is it like from, you know, th there there's government uh, subsidies, right, and then there's um, out of pocket, and so talk a little bit about that, and then I'd love to find out about Dental Beauty Partners because I think it it's really based on, you know, the the way things exist now in the U.K. and maybe how to do things a bit better. Sure, sure. So uh, the UK being a tiny little island, um, we've got around uh, 11,000 dental practices in the UK. Um, so a very small market versus the US, um, but still have around 11 billion pounds, which is whatever the exchange rate is in these days, um, you know, in terms of actual market cap. So it's still a relatively decent sized market um, and is actually the largest out of pocket market in the UK for healthcare. So it's still very much um, able to be driven by the out-of-pocket spending, which is very unique because almost every other part of the UK from Optum, veterinary, um, obviously GP and hospital services is pretty much all government funded um, and it's almost all free of charge or very heavily subsidised. So it's uh, one of our big things in the UK. Government's called got amazing amazing health service called National Health Service. Um, and if you pay taxes, or even if you live in the UK, you get it free of charge or very, 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 very little costs. So it's a, a majority of the market, well, I'd say 80% of the market, patients come in to dentists under the National Health Service as a patient. So it's a very big part, portion versus, I know Medicaid and other you know, systems are much smaller portion of the market in the US. So it's um, it's 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 there, it exists. Um, it's not fit for purpose in any way, but it, it's kind of, the culture that you pay taxes, you live in the UK, you go to the NHS for anything. Um, and that's caused a lot of issues over the last probably 10 to 15 years because the contract changed from in 2006, where they used to pay you per item for each treatment. So if you did one filling, you got paid X amount of money for that filling. It wasn't much, it was a small amount, but it was every single treatment. And what happened was, probably the same as the US, dentists took advantage of that and did loads of fillings for no reason right or loads of treatments for no reason and then you got paid lots of money for that so they changed that to say we can have three bands now in 2006 onwards up to today where each band you get paid a fixed amount for no matter how much you do per band so in band one it's cleans and exams and diagnostics band two is root canals extractions and fillings and band three is anything to do with lab work right and if i do 10 grounds 10 on lays benches as well it's all the same cost for the same treatment one payment that's it. So you can imagine how much, <laughs> yeah, and we're talking about 250 pounds for the top treat for band three, 60 pounds for band two, and I think whatever, 50 pounds for band one now. Um, so the amount of money remuneration you get at the dentist, which is only, I think, you know, 10 pounds for band one, 30 pounds for band two, 120 pounds for band three, so basically half of those 
is very minimal, like to the point where you can't even make enough money as you, if you worked in a, a supermarket. You make that more money working then you work in dentistry these days. That's how you know low pay you get. So let me let me make sure I understand this because this is much different than than the U.S. So these different bands, these three bands. So is it was band two um, crowns and, and and restorations? No, no, that's band three. Anything lab work, crowns, oh, dentistry is band three. Band okay. three. Anything non lab work, perio, um, fillings um extractions root canal band two got it okay so at band three and you're you're saying that there is a there's a fixed payment that, that the dentist receives the provider receives back whether it's one crown or five crowns okay all right is, yeah i mean to make it worse just think about band two right you get paid the same amount of money which is 50 56 pounds whatever it is or, or 30 pounds to dentist's pocket for doing extraction or root canal so imagine what options everyone thinks about hmm, let's all let's spend an hour and a half doing root canal or just spend two minutes to do extraction that's why we've got a health crisis now in the uk because essentially the system is broken and if you've got such low payments and you're not increasing the payments by even higher than inflation each year and you're not offering new contracts for new amounts of work to be done because you've kind of maxed out your spending in the government what do you do you end up just pushing patients away from the NHS because of access issues. So the funding in the UK is only enough to fund half the population for one exam for the whole year. Mm. So everyone decided to go, let's all get an exam twice a year. We couldn't fund it. <laughs> it was crazy if you think about eight of the population going for the NHS. Right. Um, so it, it's really broken, underfunded, and it's been pushed, pushed, pushed for the last 10 years to the point now where we see an exodus of dentists moving away from the NHS going fully private out of pocket and saying i've had enough of this now i just want to go there the good thing about nhs is that it's guaranteed money like evergreen contracts it will never ever run out it's fixed you hit target you get paid which is you know stable income but now after covid you know in, in, increase in terms of interest rates in the uk and, and inflation costs people are saying you know i get a four percent increase in my contract value each year versus eight percent in you know inflation doesn't add up anymore actually making loss by having that contract um so it's yeah it's been a big shift and that's really critical because actually 10 years ago some of the biggest dso's in the uk now were going crazy on buying these practices and contracts because there were no new ones being made, made available so my dentist and Bupa, some of the big corporate you know dso's in the uk with 500 600 practices 10 years ago which was back then some of the biggest in the world were just trying to acquire every single possible contract they can put their hands on it was like frenzy they were paying eight nine times EBITDA for these practices 10 years ago just to get their hands on these contracts so they thought were evergreen fixed income guaranteed money hit your target to get paid great for you know other charge capital growth you would do a, a three or four year exit right and that all went downhill when dentists start saying well we don't want to do insurance this we don't want to be doing this kind of entry anymore we don't want to be making ourselves some sort of machine but to saying 50 people a day a 10 minute appointments just so we can hit these targets and they're saying let's just do more out of pocket work and see april a day properly one hour each and do some proper dentistry now and it's become a bit of a a dirty word the nhs in terms of doing that kind of dentistry no one wants to be doing it it's not a cool thing to be doing it's not uh you know in the culture of young dentists these days to be doing that kind of work and as a result of that you have my dentist for example had 650 practices i think when i graduated 10 years ago um, they saw about 150 of them off in two different batches of the last 10 years because they were empty, physically empty. No one wants to work there. There were bad locations outside, you know, suburbs. Plus, they were very heavy on NHS contracts, which is making you work crazy amount of hours. I'm talking about um, an average dentist in the UK would deliver 6,000 UDAs full time. Now, UDA is a unit of activity. So you get one UDA, band one, which is that exam, remember the diagnostics. Right. You get three UDAs, no matter how many you do, or band two, which is your fillings and clean uh, your fillings, extractions, and perio. And you get 12 UDAs for band three, which is your crowns and you know, lab work, dentures, etc. Yeah. So to keep it simple, uh, the average normal dentist would do about six thousand three or four years ago. And that was the norm. These DSOs were buying practices that had to do 10,000 per chair just to just to hit targets. 
maybe even 12,000 per chair. So imagine you're doing 25 patients a day normally, like if you're a busy dentist, they're doing 50 people a day mm. in one day, clinical sessions every day, six days a week, just to hit the targets, would you burn out? And as a result of that, those practices were sold for nothing, for free of charge, one pound, just to get rid of them um, off those DSOs kind of balance sheets, loss making. And it's, as I said to you when I met you, it's, it's a crazy kind of thought that, you know, at one point we had one of the biggest DSOs in the world because we were very mature. We actually got into consolidation much earlier than the US did and much earlier than other countries in the in, in the world. And now they've gone backwards from 650 to 500. <laughs> so are those, some of those practices just probably weren't sold at all, right? They just shut down completely and then others were pretty much given away. Yeah, it's it's hard to shut them down because of the contract with the government. You have to uh, give them away for like one pound like or like free of charge basically so yeah you just give it away basically got it yeah very very interesting okay so that's that's a little bit about the 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 uk market you know really you know different than than what's going on here in the states right now anyway uh so um talk about dental beauty partners now and it sounds like you know dental beauty partners came out of this you know interesting you know landscape right and that you have in the uk yeah, so I'll just add a few more points to the market. Um, one of the biggest issues, which is not just the UK, I think globally, has been recruitment for the last probably six, seven years. That was because of those, you know, the, the model issue, right? How do you have a model that is actually relevant for what the people in the market want? Right. And when I graduated and when I put my first practice on my own in 2015, a couple of years out of, out of graduating, I I was going to 10, 15, 20 viewings, you know, a, a year trying to find the right practice for me and it took me a year and a half to find it after a few that fell through. Um, when I found it, you know, I was up against Bupa, which was, you know, Oasis back then. It was a very large TSO and my dentist, who both offered 10 times EBITDA on the I want to buy. Now, I'm an individual young guy, you know, come from nothing, trying to buy my first practice thinking, you know, how am I putting in 10 times one practice? I, I put an offer about eight times. And luckily, the owner thought, you know what? I like you more than these corporates. I'll send it to you. Well, I got lucky, right? Bought my first practice at a bit better than normal price than it was in the market. Um, and what I realized was every group out there was doing the same thing, the exact same model. You buy a practice either on the NHS, that was heavily NHS focused or heavily private focused. And you did a five-year earn out or three-year earn out, two-year earn out, where you know you typically get the vendor to stay in for two or three years. You give them 20, 30 percent of the of, of the enterprise value over the next three years, paying targets. And you know, that's how the model works. And it's all 100 percent owned by the same entity. Um, but when you're up to a certain size of 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 clinics, you have so many different layers of you know red tape to get a new chair fixed or to get some new materials, or you get told by an area manager that um, who works for Walmart, you know, I, I work for Walmart for 15, uh, you know, supermarkets, I know better than you do about what implants to use. And you, and you, and you wonder why there's a huge churn of just talent in those practices. And as soon as that earn out finished, that three year, four year tie in, the vendor left, the best dentist in the practice left, and you got an excess of, of staff just leaving. And then you just saw the revenue and EBITDA just drop. From that eight, nine times you're paying for, it went down by another 20, 30 percent. So you're paying probably 40, 14 times even after one practice. And debt levels are never, never that good. It was never like, you know, getting 14 times debt levels, right? It's always like, you know, five or six maximum. So there was a huge over leverage issue. So what I realized from those four things was you need to make a model where you've got local leadership, where you don't have to have 10 different layers of democracy to get anything done. Secondly, you need to have complete clinical autonomy. Which everyone says I do, but actually, how do you do that if you haven't got someone clinical on the ground? It's impossible, right? The next one that um, was was quite critical was um, location. Do not buy at not in a good location where people want to be. And I mean, dentists, you know, your staff, they are not want to live there and they're young. They're, you've got one place to be. So you can't find a coastline or like in a village in the middle of, you know, middle of England. You've got to find an area where people will, you know, will actually want to work and live. And they have no issues having downtime for six months of empty chair space. And then the fourth thing was, um, how do you incentivize people to actually be part of a bigger thing, right? You know, hundreds of ownership is all good for the for the PE guys or for the guys who own the business, you know, as a whole. But when you hit five, six, ten practices, you're not there anymore. You can't physically be 
you can't influence business because you're not physically in the practice anymore. So actually, you can't be that you know 100 people, 200 practices, or 500 practices in the future. So actually, all those things led to us thinking, let's change the whole model and create the first ever DPO, you know, in the UK, um, and actually create a model whereby if you've got a partner in the practice who's young, entrepreneurial, ambitious, needs mentorship and help from the back office side of things, finance, HR, marketing, et cetera, et cetera, together the partnership, you can really grow a business really well. And if you buy the right business in the UK, which is the majority of them, underutilized, not branded, no marketing, no specialisms in-house, no patient journey, just, I mean, it, it is, when you come to the UK, I, I hope kind of, when you can come, Bill, but you look at a practice, it's like a semi-detached house that looks like it shouldn't even be a medical building, but it is, it's the practice. And they have a, a surgery in a lounge and they use that as a practice. And they say, this is our practice because they've got a condo from the government. There's no need to do any marketing because you've got guaranteed patients forever coming in that front door because there's a huge under, under supply of these contracts. So you don't have to do any marketing, no investment in the business and no need to reinvest, you know, to grow it or to make it more modern or anything. It will look very dingy and old. And that's the that's a norm in the UK. And people think it's normal. So I want to also add one more facet to that. It's the fifth thing, which is actually make the most modern, up-to-date, beautiful practice you can make in the UK. So actually you can attract new patients that people want to come and spend out of pocket for. So those are the five reasons why we did what we did. And then we created the first DPA where we would acquire a practice from an old vendor who is probably not doing too much in terms of revenue or care or number of days in the business. So it's very much driven by a contract from the NHS. So it's almost guaranteed money, but very, very small, two chairs, maybe one, two, three chairs running at any point. We then say, all right, that's got three or four empty rooms in that same building. Let's add four more surgeries in that same building, operatories as you call it. Add four more, say it's a six or seven. We'll put a partner in now. So we'll, come in, we'll bring a new partner in who's been trained up by one of my, by our team centrally or works for us already as an associate. Bring him in there as a partner of equity. So it's a 51 full asset model. And they'll actually be our partner in the business and run it two, three days a week clinically and one day management, um, but actually be the heart of the business. And by doing that, you have your kind of same in the US model, you know, your, your back-end services, we call it shared service center in the UK. And below that, you have all your individual companies with partners at each one running it and growing it from three to six chairs. So we go from eight times multiple to four times within the first probably 12 to 18 months. No, oh, that's great. That's, uh, and and I'm, I, I would assume that uh, the younger dentists are looking for something like this. Uh, so it's, and you touched on the recruitment. Um, you know, what are, because we have issues here in, in the States, especially, I mean, it was probably pre-COVID, but when COVID hit all of a sudden, we couldn't find dental assistants, hygienists, and, and dentists. In some cases, it was just really a challenge. Um, talk about you talked about it from a recruitment standpoint. It sounds like your model is is what younger clinicians would want, right? You know, they're in, you're, it's it's a you know, kind of. I guess that's where the name came from, right? Dental beauty partners, right? The practice is beautiful. You know, it's in a location that the dentist wants to practice as well, which is which is great. Um, talk about, you know, the issues with um, recruitment and retention of clinicians. And, and I guess you have dental nurses there as well, right? Yeah. So I'm um, I, I'm still would consider myself a young dentist and just turned 33. So I'm, I'm still young. You are. Been, I'm in that age group. I know what dentists in my age group, my friends, my network, what they want. OK. And actually, it's not just about having a beautiful practice in a nice location. It's the it's the priceless piece of mentorship that you just can't put a price on, and that's what they want. Because unfortunately, in the UK, I don't know about the US, but you come out of university in the UK, and you get experience of maybe doing one or two crowns, one or two root canals, and maybe you're lucky to do a few extractions. That is it in five years, right? That's all you get training for. So you come out completely blind to how the world works in terms of the real dentistry. In the after the first year of training year, you do ten times more, hundred times more than that from university. But you're still not that great at doing actually the up-to-date latest techniques and you know all the best clinical um, treatments. So you have to do a, a lot of courses. I did a thousand hours of CPD, which is like you know continual development, uh, within three years after I graduated, which is a lot. That's like every weekend, every single week, evening, just doing courses and you know masters, diplomas, and implants, ortho, cosmetic treatments, all of it. And I spent over two hundred thousand pounds on courses, and I was like, 
this doesn't make any sense. I went to university to spend five years and learned nothing. I've come out, spent all this money to do it myself. And now I've just learned everything my own. But like, why did I, and I, I know mentor as well. Whereas now with our model, we're giving some of the best dentists an opportunity to buy a first practice, but also mentor dentists below them in their practice to become like them as well. And that works so well because as a young dentist, yes, I live in London, the big city. Yes, I've got a knife practice to work with all the technology and the gadgets. But more importantly, I get teaching. I get mentorship on actually all those treatments I want to do courses on. I come back and do my first implant on my first onlay on my first Invisalign case. And I get to do it with a mentor who can hold my hand for the first five or six cases. And the partner's incentivized to do it because he's like, well, actually, for me, I'm not, I'm not making this business grow by me grossing lots of money. I'm making it grow by everyone else grossing money for me. So he's incentivized to get them to grow more for business growth as well. So it's, it really works beautifully in terms of that whole kind of, you know, what they want. Um, but the two most important things were location and making sure you've got that private out-of-pocket opportunity. If you've got lots of UDAs to deliver and you say, you can come work for us, we'll do 9,000 UDAs, they say, no way. And it actually got worse after COVID. It went from 3,000 average per chair of what people wanted to like 1,000 per chair now. That's like just doing emergencies and exams, that's it. So it's really changing the market all the time. We have to keep constantly changing our model about what we're acquiring, what we're looking at, so an M&A point of view. So buying the right things of what dentists want rather than just buying what we think is best and then realizing that no one wants to work there. So our model is always been driven by recruitment, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it, it sure does. So um, what year was Dental Beauty Partners formed? 2019. 2019. Um, as we stand today, as it stands today, how many locations? And you, know, you mentioned London, but where 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 are those locations? So um, we've got 44 clinics right now, um, and they're in London, Manchester, and Birmingham. So actually, the three big cities. We recently did two platform acquisitions, small ones, um, with four clinics each, last year in Manchester and Birmingham. Um, they're very much Genovo kind of models, uh, but we've obviously partnered with that mini group to then obviously grow out and take over the whole of that kind of that, that city, Manchester and Birmingham as well. So we're very much doing uh, a, a, a strategic approach to the three big cities in, in, in the whole of the UK maximizing those ones first and then literally just circle around all those three towns you get a circle get mapped put a circle around it we're based all around those and then same manchester and same birmingham okay and you mentioned that you're pretty much you know, all specialties are in-house right so you're doing pretty much everything yes yeah so we we once again we work backwards what do patients want now so we worked out what about recruitment right that's great now you've got that you've got all your chairs recruited for you've got all your, all your, in the right places now how do you make it for patients and patients want you know extended long hours after work and weekends they want to have all your dads all the dentistry in house not traveling an hour to see a perio specialist now to see an implant guy they want to have you know state-of-the-art equipment and and services in terms of the way it looks and feels in the practice and you know that whole patient journey and they also want to have you know really good communication and education about what's wrong with their teeth and you know what option they've got and have everything available to them so even though we have a contract with government, we give them all the options. We give, normally have a one hour to 45-minute 40, 40 appointment for all new patients, even our existing patients can take over. It's a really long time to spend in total with them. We've got a 60-inch TV screen in all the practices. They can see their photographs of the teeth and SLR cameras about what's wrong, along with ITRO scanners or, or, or TRIO scanners to show them, you know, before and after images, um, as well as taking, you know, with Pearl and X-rays and showing them, you know, what, what, what you can do in terms of, you know, second opinion with Pearl. Um, so we have all these different options all within, you know, uh, uh, that one hour appointment that gives them an experience that they've never seen before. I mean, remember this is comparing to a normal NHS practice, which gives you a 10 minute to five minute appointment. You come in, sit down, LA, filling, amalgam, out the door, done. That's what normally happens. Don't talk to you, don't, don't say hi, Bill. We just go in the mouth, open, out, in. Five minute appointment, that's all you get. So this is like a whole new thing for them. They're like, wow, this is like, doesn't exist even. And we're we're offering it in locations where it's close to them, not like you know having to travel two hours out of town. They're like they're around really good locations around the, the, the kind of London, Manchester, Birmingham area. Um, so yeah, we've just created a, a an in-house multi-special and multidisciplinary approach to dentistry that's given the kind of those high-end, you know, New York, you know, Larry Rosenthal, I don't know, whatever you, you know, you're top of the side these days in America, but those kind of top dentistry thing in America would give you all the specialities in house. We give that to all our practices or within a two mile radius at least. Um, and the partners, because they obviously are incentivized to 
work together, they also refer between each other within our group as well. If there's one CBCT, for example, in a two mile radius, they'll do a hub and spoke model and refer to each other as well. So it works really well and it kind of, you know, ticks the boxes of patients. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that sounds great. So tell me a little bit about what you see as the future for dental beauty partners. Yeah, look, I think um, I met up with uh, MB2 when I was out in, in Chicago and uh, it, it's, you know, I, I think it's something similar to that from the sounds of it, you know, it's, um, it's it, we can keep growing as much as we can and, and keep going because we're in a very unique position right now. No one's doing what we're doing in the UK or in Europe. We're the only ones doing it. And I, I was amazed that MB2 was doing it well, so I'm really happy that someone else is doing the world. Um, but, you know, doing that actual partnership model and, and growing it um, the way we're doing it, as a dentist coming out of university now working, you've got two options. You bite yourself or you or you bite of us. That is it. There's other options out there. So the fact that only that, that option's there, and we've got a huge network of, you know, our current partners saying they're friends of friends. We've got a lot of room to grow. We feel we can get to 100 sites in two years and and, and, and kind of keep, keep flying more and more above that, right? So I think the only thing stopping us right now is just the multiples in the UK getting even crazier than before. I mean... With interest rates increasing and, and leverage multiples decreasing, they're still keeping the multiples at nine times, which is mm. obscene, right? Um, but that's for a solo individual side, not even a group solo right. side. So it just becomes the point now we're thinking about doing more de novos. We're focusing on that now. And as I mentioned last time, that's something that we really focus on this year, trying to do 10 of those this year and see if that works. And if that works, it could be a new way forward. Uh, yeah, that, that that's interesting. Uh, the multiples are, are, are that high and... Uh... Yeah. So uh, de novo, and we've heard that here, even in the States, that there are some groups that were traditionally acquisition based, which have started to do more de novos just because of the, the uh, cost of the acquisition. And um, if, if you get good at it, right, and it does take some practice it, 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 and, and you have a provider that you can put in that practice, then you're in good shape. But your model already seems like it, it makes sense. You have the, the right model from a recruitment perspective. Okay, so I asked you about the future of dental beauty partners. What about the future of dentistry? I know that's like a giant topic, but you know, maybe in like uh, five minutes, what does that look like, at least in your eyes? Yeah, so I think it's um, it, it's really exciting to one of you because there's so many new technologies coming out now that I think are gonna really change the way that we deliver dentistry and the way that we think about dentistry. Um, I think it's not, there's so much data-driven dentistry out there now in terms of the softwares we're giving. It's making everything more standardized. I think from last 20 years ago, it was all much feel with your hands. What do you think is right? Is that the right thing to do or wrong thing to do? Just because you've got good experience with your hands. Now it's very much about data, software, AI. Can we actually, you know, prove that that's the right thing on a multi, you know, by doing it on a much bigger scale? Because no matter what happens, DSOs will become the future. It's just, it's just the way the world works, right? Any healthcare industry. In the UK, veterinary, pharmacy, um, Optom, they've all happened the same thing. Eight percent consolidated now, all owned by two or three big players. That's it. It'll happen dentistry in the next five, ten years in the UK for sure. We're already 35% owned by corporates. So it's a amount of time. I think they're saying five years will be owned by 80%. So, you know, it'll be DSA owned. And when it's DSA owned, how do you then scale up the quality of dentistry and improve technologies and efficiencies? That comes from technology, simple as that. So it has to be technology led. And I think we'll start seeing more and more of um, these technologies becoming more normal practice, business as usual, versus, oh, that's AI was so cool, you know, two years ago, it was like the thing that might happen in five years. There could be robots in five years doing implants from, from, from you know, at this rate. So I think technology is, is just going to change industry. And, and I think it become a lot less um, inefficient. You know, right now, you think about dentists, what they do for day-to-day -day work, only 10% of the work they do now actually have to be done by a dentist. It could be done by a therapist or a hygienist or someone else or a machine even. You know, a lot of it is basic stuff, but actually the bit you need to do is like the crown preps and the fillings and some of that. So, you know, extraction. So I think you can become a lot more efficient and maybe make your streamlined dentistry in terms of the way you work. Um, DSOs will take over. Um, and I also think that there's going to be a lot more focus on competition because when you do get these kind of bigger DSOs, apart from the locations of where you are and who's closer, I think that quality of service is going to become the deciding factor between that one and that one. Um, and I think if your quality of service and patient journey is right, you'll win. 
So, so let me make sure I got this right. Right now, the market is in the UK is about 35% consolidated. And you're thinking in the next five to 10 years, it's pretty much going to be dominated by group practices and DSOs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, 20% of that is large corporates. 15% of that is mini corporates. The mini corporates are up less than 10 bucks. They're all buying two or three more each right now anyway. So right. it, I think five years maximum is probably where it's going to be before it gets to the point where it's 70%. You know, that kind of, tipping point where you start getting the two big three or big three players and this year alone their top 10 dso's have all been eaten up by some of the top four or five so you've had four or five big consolidation mergers already this year that have led, led to two or three big groups only now right. um it's, yeah it's happening it's not even it's happening now let alone you know in five years time but it's going to happen more and more for sure yeah, and that's, I mean, that's really what we're seeing here as well. I mean, that really follows pretty closely as far as at 35%. That's the number that that I hear. You know, again, it depends on what, what qualifies as a DSO in somebody's mind. But I think that really, um, and the five to 10 year uh, outlook, we've heard 75 to 80% of the US will be consolidated by then. So very, very similar to what you're seeing in the UK. Okay, Dev, this, is, this has been great. Um, if people want to find out more about Dental Beauty Partners, uh, how do they do that? Um, we've got a website, just dentalbeautypartners.co.uk. Um, so check out the website. I'm on LinkedIn. You know, you always DM me directly. But yeah, I mean, uh, happy to connect with anyone or to find out a bit more about what we do. So we'll drop uh, Deb's LinkedIn uh, info in the show notes. And it's just in case you didn't understand Dev with his uh, UK uh, British accent there, because he does speak a little quickly and we speak quickly here. It's dentalbeautypartners.co.uk. It's not .com. It's dentalbeautypartners.co.uk. Um, yes. But but yeah, great, great stuff. It was a pleasure actually being on that panel discussion with you and it worked out really well. And, and thanks for taking the time out of your day uh, to spend with the Group Dentistry Now audience. It's um, some, some great insights into what's going on over there. And we'll keep our eyes on Dental Beauty Partners and how you grow in the next couple of years. Thank you so much, Bill, for having me. Yep. Thank you. Dr. Dev Patel, CEO and founder of Dental Beauty Partners. Again, all contact information will be in the show notes. And thanks everybody for, for listening in today. Uh, this has been the Group Dentistry Now show. And until next time, I'm Bill Newman. Thanks for listening. The Group Dentistry Now show has listeners across North and South America, Europe, Asia, and Australia. If you like our show, subscribe today and please tell your colleagues about us. Thank you.